Welcome uh, to our March episode of the Power Platform Developer Office Hours. Um, we'll get started here. Hold on. Hey folks, I'm Mark Schweigert. I, uh, for those of you who knew who Kartik was, I am the new Kartik. So I just um, joined this team uh, in the last month uh, from a, a different role at Microsoft. Um, I'm a longtime Power Platform developer myself, uh, and now I'm, I'm leading the team that uh, uh, is building a lot of the Power Platform developer tools um, and working with partner teams. And so one of the things I've asked Shafkat to, to do um, today is switch to a different um, question tool. We're going to use the Ask Me Anything tool. That's going to enable us to collect your questions real time. People can vote up questions. Um, my old team used to use this a lot, and, and we found it pretty effective. So I'd encourage people um, to go ahead and you know start jamming your questions into the AMA tool. Um, and vote up the tools that you you like. I'm sorry. Vote up the questions that you like the most, um, and we will answer the most voted questions first, and hopefully try to get through all the questions. Already noticed some questions um, in the the chat that certainly, as a user of the tools myself for many many years, um, are things that I've asked for. Um, and so, you know, certainly let us know, and we'll we'll talk about some of those things as you uh, throw questions in the chat. Um, another thing, you know, I'm, I've asked. Uh, uh, Shafkat to do. Uh, Shafkat, you might want to unmute yourself because I had muted you because you were talking over um, while you couldn't hear me. Um, okay. So, yeah, no, awesome. Um, so one, another thing that I've asked Shafkat to do um, is we, we kind of want to, to an extent, um, reset this this uh, um, developer community call, right? And, you know, my ask of you is, is um, to put feedback in the AMA tool Make it brutally honest. You know we've got thick skin, and and you know we appreciate constructive criticism. Um, let us know uh, what what we we could could do, or what you would like us to do better in terms of making this more valuable for you uh, and your attendance. You know we we appreciate the time investment that you make. Uh, we appreciate you know you as customers, and so um, we really want to get hear from you on on how we can make these calls better. Now, the general goal that what we will do is try to bring together. So the core team that runs these calls is in Power Apps um, Studio, what we call the Pro Dev Pod team that builds tools like Pack CLI and uh, lots of other things. But um, pro development across Power Platform is a a team sport, right? And so we will do our best to invite our friends like Anthony Sheehy, who's, who's on the call, and others across the platform to make sure that this can be a, um, a one-stop shop for all of your questions. Um, one of the things I will emphasize, and I'll ask Shafkat to put a disclaimer moving forward in the slides for this, is that this is not a supplement for Microsoft support, right? We will absolutely do our best to help you help answer your questions, but oftentimes, you know, the answer to your question will be go file a support ticket, right? Um, and it's it's not a personal troubleshooting hour, it's a it's an office hour, so let's, be you know mindful and respectful of of everybody and and what they're trying to get out of the, the call itself, um, and uh, with that I will hand it back over to Shafkat. We'll get through the agenda. We'll jump into the AMA and let's make this a, a collaborative conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, so yeah, now since everybody can hear me, and thank you, Mark, for getting the recovery done. Uh, appreciate that. All right, so um, in this call, as Mark mentioned, uh, we have uh, colleagues here from uh, different uh, areas of Power Platform. We have Anthony here, we um, have uh, Marcel, again, Mark is here. Uh, he has a lot of experience, as you mentioned. So, um, and then Andrew and, and a few other folks. Um, let's uh, let's get this rolling here. So I'm just going to go through some uh, normal things that we go through. What are we uh, here for? We'd like to um, make sure that this is, uh, as Mark mentioned also, uh, which I uh, mentioned in um, our, all of our um, office hours, that this is um, office hours. We want to uh, make sure that we listen to your concerns and um, any additional questions, if it requires a support ticket, uh, please do so. Um, we'll we'll um, take the feedback and we want to make sure we are not discussing any NDA material. Um, if there's uh, any question about the NDA material, um, I would request to refrain from it. Um, also, at the same time, 
This is strictly for Power Platform developer tools. Uh, if you have questions outside of Power Platform, um, please uh, reach out uh, outside of this uh, office hours and we'll get things rolling. Um, with that, let's uh, move on. Uh, how often do we meet? Um, is third Thursday of the month, um, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Pacific time, which is Redmond time here. Um, what we talk about is, um, is strictly about Power Platform uh, developer tools. Um, we will discuss if there is any release of Pax CLI, we'll discuss a um, very high level, not too much in detail. Uh, we do want to take feedback. We have uh, forms for question. Feel free to drop us those questions. Uh, we'd be happy to get back to you on that. Uh, someone is someone has a question here. All right, um, let's let's keep rolling here. Um, so there is a uh, link on the screen. You can go to uh, Prodev Office Hours, and you there's a form. You can go ahead and submit uh, your questions, and we'll follow up from there. Uh, you want to know more about the community? There's also a link right on your screen uh, now. Uh, diving in. Well, we had a release of PAX CLI um, the, earlier this week, so we are moving slowly to rest of the areas where GitHub Actions and Azure DevOps developer tools. Um, but to uh, those have those are slowly rolling out. Um, it's really hot off the press right now. So some of the fixes that we are uh, we have made in this release are listed uh, for like a auth profile. When you're creating auth profile on, uh, there was an issue for Mac users uh, when they're using Service Principal. Uh, they were uh, getting errors. That has been fixed. Same thing with the. Uh, manage identity that uh, on on uh, with a create that issue has been fixed as well as when you have expired or invalid um, SPN uh, service principle logged in and you want to clear like with a pack auth clear um, there was a bug that has been fixed also uh, it was just leaving things alone anyway uh, moving forward. Um, let me know if I'm uh, moving too fast. Um, I want to make sure that I give you guys time to um, ask questions. Um, so with the pack solution area, um, we have made fixes in um, pack and unpack, pack solution pack, pack solution unpack. Um, and what was the issue here? That um, when you have organization settings um, in a solution and you do the pack after you do the unpack, um, we were losing the uh, folder with organization settings. Well, that has been fixed. So um, this should not be an issue. Also with the solution, pack solution sync, um, when you're doing a sync with your solution, um, it was looking for a solution.xml in a other folder and it was not able to find. So there was a um, suggested uh, it, um, solution posted on the GitHub issue, um, but you no longer have to use the uh, the workaround. Um, it has been fixed in the recent release. Um, that should be good to go. Um, power effects capability for REPL or run your um, the file uh, with power effects expressions. You could, um, there are some updates to um, errors and issues that that has been done. Um, also with the co-pilot capability, there, there was an issue with the uh, loading um, export template. Um, that has been fixed. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I want to give you guys uh, opportunity to discuss um, other issues you might have, ask questions. Um, by the way, the uh, also as uh, Mark pasted also here, uh, AMA tool, uh, the questions, please keep putting your questions, concerns in there, keep giving us feedback. Um, while I'm going through this content, I'm giving you the opportunity to go ahead and provide some of this so we can actually have a the good material to talk about uh, further down. Um, again, a little reminder on the PowerFX capability. Uh, if you haven't tried it, 
try it and give us feedback. Why, um, what, what is um, hindering you from it? What is stopping you from not using it? Um, what is your scenario? Would love to know your scenarios that, um, what is the challenge you're trying to solve? Um, I, so just go ahead and give it a shot. We've added more formulas. Um, Phil, great. <laughs> this has been uh, a very important ask. Um, it is uh, it is on list of things. Um, uh, given that it's a preview feature, we are uh, looking into um, having this IntelliSense uh, feature built. Um, so thank you so much for raising this. Um, and, and, and yes, we know about this and definitely will uh, keep you guys posted. Moving on, um, we're going to talk about some of the previously uh, submitted questions. Um, let's see, are you guys able to see the questions that were previously submitted in the AMA tool? Can someone give me a, a thumbs up? If they okay, um, would you mind voting for those questions and see if any one of you guys are running into um, the same issue here, or do you guys want to have the same um, concern? Um, you want additional feature uh, or what have you? Can can um, can you guys vote up? OK. So there is. Uh, OK, so I'll give one more minute here. Looking good, looking good. OK, OK. So let's uh, let's see. The top one is um, how many are first time joiners? Okay, well at least hey, I have hey, two votes here. Shafkat, can you share yes. your desktop so people can see the questions as we're reading them off? Oh, of course. Yes, let me do that. Thank you. There is good point. Thank you. Let me know when you can see my desktop. We can see it now. All right. All right. Excellent. Um, with that, um, let's see. First one is how many um, are first time donors? That's my question, but why I ask is that was one of the questions that was submitted that a, a person is a first time joiner and they would like to know more about how to um, experience uh, the, the capabilities in Power Platform. So at least I two, uh, I see two additional um, folks here. So thank you for joining. Let me thank you first on that. Um, I will uh, I, I will provide. So there's some training workshops. Uh, I will provide link uh, links in the chat, and there are uh, some um, app in a day type of uh, training that you can you guys can go ahead and. Uh, use that and also reach out to us. We'll be happy to help you. Whatever your projects are, um, we'll be happy to work with your uh, with you to get your projects going. Um, and if anyone else wants to add some uh, additional context to it, please please free, uh, feel free. Um, Mark, Marcel, anyone else want to add this? Yeah, maybe if we could get um, you know since since uh, this person who submitted this question is new, if we could get folks. Just maybe raise your hand if this is your first time uh, coming to the call. You know, we just get a sense of how many people attending today are first time attendees. Welcome, Joe. Thanks for for joining. Let's see who else raises their hand. Shafka, there is a way um, I have to go look at the tool where you can pin the question while you're answering it. So you're not seeing it jump up and down while you read. Um, OK, I'll nice. have to... let me do here. Uh... All right, so it looks like Joe's the, the only person who's new. So anybody who's new or listening to the recording, you know, welcome to to the office hours for sure. Um, you know, we we will do our best to you know help point you to getting started. A lot, you know, the the community is diverse, right? There's gonna be a lot of new people who have limited pro dev power platform background. There's gonna be people who've been doing this, you know, for 14, 20 years, depending on how long you've been around Dynamic CRM and understand the evolution of you know, Dynamics, Dynamics CRM, Dynamics 365, and all the parts of the power platform merging together. Um, and so, you know, I certainly encourage people as, you know, this for, for this to not be a one-way communication. Like if you have thoughts or opinions, raise your hand. We'll ask you to come off mute. Um, this is recorded, so you have to be comfortable 
uh, you know, having your voice uh, be recorded. You can also uh, ask questions anonymously if you if you want to. Um, uh, Shafkar, doesn't look like we have the anonymous setting turned on, but OK, that's fine. Um, uh, so let's go okay. ahead and mark this one. I'm going to try to go back to the moderation. Okay. Sorry, folks, sure. this is our first time using the, the new tool, so. OK, um, it's, it's been done, uh, Mark. So, <clears throat> OK, nice. so next one we have is, uh, let's see. So the next one we have uh, our friend Phil. Uh, has a question. There's a wide variety of community and internal tools with little consensus on how or the best way to test power apps uh, of all types. Um, good, good question. Um, we, we can you are... finish reading the let's read the whole th question to the audience okay. so people can hear. OK, um, are there any updates on test engine, especially for model driven apps? It would be great if there were more recommendations, examples, demo, labs on testing the platform from unit testing, C sharp, JavaScript, PowerFX, integration tests, and UI tests. Um, yeah, so, so I'll, I'll take this one, Shafkat. Um, great. Phil, we, we hear you loud and clear. I certainly hear you loud and clear. My old team um, did not do nearly as much test automation as we wanted to, and we were very eager for um, test engine to evolve. Um, I would say, um, and I will say this in general, uh, we we listen to feedback, but we get a ton of feedback. And so the more we have publicly availed, like vote this one up if you agree and you're on the call, but more importantly, let's make sure that we have a, a place publicly, whether it's the community forums and Shafkat and I can kind of brainstorm on this or on, on one of our GitHub repos where you're asking for this and let's make sure uh, we get lots of upvotes on it because we do pay attention to the upvotes. Um, you know, as as you can imagine, um, you know, with as big of a backlog as we may have at Microsoft, there's lots of things that don't get make it past the cut line. And I, I can certainly relate to people who get frustrated with that because there's things that have been on the platform that I've been asking for for years that just haven't made it past the cut line. And and more often than not, it's 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 a balance between the resources we have. You know our investments we can't really talk about right now that that we have as well as um you know customer requests and and prioritization right and so test engine um yes it is something that is under our team um it is something that we are um actively looking at um seeing if we can prioritize test engine uh we're well aware of the the gaps around model driven apps pcf components uh etc uh, and the desire to have a unified testing framework across model driven canvas custom pages, you know, uh, insert more across the platform over time. Um, we do not have anything right now that we can share in terms of timelines. Uh, as soon as we're, we're kind of going through the planning process and as soon as I have more details as to whether or not uh, the investments in test engine uh, make the, the cut line, if you will, for planning, you know, we will be transparent about it. Um, but hear you loud and clear. Uh, Phil, in terms of the need and the demand, and I, I felt it, you know, firsthand in in my previous role. For for those of you who don't know, my previous role, the team I led built the COE starter kit, the creator kit, the ALM accelerator, the approvals kit, the automation kit. I'm sure I'm forgetting some of the kits. There's some other kit, the Dataverse accelerator, right? And so we were like you, building you know complex power platform solutions with code first extensibility, and and so I certainly understand the need for um, uh, 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 more consolidated and, and you know, testing approach from Microsoft versus the myriad of approaches that are highly opinionated that, you know, many people have have opinions of. Um, and uh, we will we'll hopefully be, be able to say something a little bit more next office hours, um, but uh, stay tuned. All right, so uh, I hope that answers the uh, concern here. OK, so we'll go to the next one here. Uh, Mark, that is uh, by you. Vote this up if you'd like us to open up the tool well before the call so people can ask questions, vote up, and uh, so we can make sure we bring the right folks across the platform to the meeting. Yeah, so one of the things I've noticed in these calls, and Shafkat and I have talked about this, is that you know, sometimes people will will uh, share questions and then not show up for the meeting, and then we'll answer the question, and, and people who are attending the meeting you know, don't really get much value out of answering a question that nobody on the call is asking about. Um, other things 
you know, is that, that you know, as these kinds of meetings grow larger, um, sort of making sure we're addressing the most important questions to a diverse community is challenging. And so one of the thoughts that we've had is, you know, put it out there, like maybe as quickly as tomorrow, right? Open it up for next month, right? Or maybe a couple of weeks before the next call, right? And remind people, you know, that you can go ask questions, vote questions up, socialize with your friends, right? And really start to build the most important questions, the most important uh, pieces of feedback for us to listen to from you so that when we arrive at these, we're coordinating with, um, you know, the right people at Microsoft because, you know, Shafkat's, you know, a, has a certain expertise. I have a certain expertise. Anthony does, Marcel does, Matt Barber does, whoever attends. And and what we want to do is we want to make sure that all the um, the, the people who are, own these areas are able to either attend or help us get the questions answered. And one of the best ways to do that is to give you more time to ask your questions ahead of time and then give us time to prepare so that this meeting is really useful and we don't have to say, well, come back a month in a month so we can give you an answer, right? So um, it's one of the ideas we wanna to toy with. So it's probably something we'll experiment with for next month, is just letting folks know. And, and when we do that, we appreciate you folks, whatever social media mechanisms you use, Twitter, LinkedIn, you know, emails, talking to your your friends at work, whatever it is, grabbing a beer at the local pub, or you know, just let people know. And and the more the more the merrier. Uh, it creates a richer experience for everyone. So thank you. All right, excellent. Okay, we'll get moving to the next one. Um, okay, um, our friend uh, Phil has another question. At a previous Power Platform conference, circa September 2022, um, there was a roadmap slide. Where in the future column was an entry, native YAML serialization. Is this still on the roadmap? Could you provide any more insight, please? Yeah, Phil, I'm going to make you happy. Um, this is unannounced, um, but it is no longer an NDA because it will be published. Uh, I'm releasing it out of NDA. We will publish it in the release notes soon. It's just a matter of getting through the publishing process. Um, but this is one of our major investments um, this coming semester. And so we'll have more to say about it at build and you know post build. But rest assured, um, we are uh, bringing uh, the experimental YAML tooling thing that, that some of you are familiar with out of experimental, out of an external tooling thing. We're bringing it into the service. We are making it um, just part of how Power Apps works and you will in the fullness of time, have YAML viewing, YAML plus PowerFX full screen viewing and editing experiences within um, Power App Studio, and then we will complement it over time with richer experiences uh, within Visual Studio. That's sort of the the vision around it. Now, the tactics and the exact timelines, you know, are still a bit to be determined. But this is a one of our major investments. Um, Marcel, who is the PM on the call, is is the the pm owner for this feature set so i'm sure uh, as we we're ready to talk even more about this in the future marcel will be eager to get your feedback we're really excited about it we we shared it with the mvps at mvp summit there was a lot of excitement there about the work we're doing and we just just teased a little bit of where we're going and so <laughs> uh, stay tuned so you'll be happy phil <laughs> all right moving on to the next one um Here's another question from our friend, our friend Phil. Um, is there any update on the better support for built web resources, for example, TypeScript? It would be great if the Power Platform CLI could be enhanced for built web resources, example, transpile transcript, a uh, TypeScript, mind, uh, mind, huh, mini, minified JavaScript, reduced image resources, ResX files, etc. Perhaps. So Go ahead. Yeah, go, keep going. Sorry, I thought I thought this the question was done. Sorry. Uh, okay. So yeah, perhaps some uh, something similar to Pack Solution add resource re resource reference, along with a new project type Pack Solution in it, um, with a kind let's, type script to initialize. Yeah. So let's let's works. talk about this one. So there's a lot buried into this one, Phil. So I'm gonna try to decompose it a little bit and dissect it. So one of the challenges with with web resources, and you know, and this is something we'd love to get your feedback on, is that all the hooks are in there already to do things like uh, on 
like if you, so let me start with CDS Proj, right? CDS Proj and, you know, Pack Solution Init, Pack Solution Sync, Pack Solution Clone, right? This is the modern way, um, you know, compared to some of the legacy CRM tools, this is the modern way to build solutions and build solutions that are a combination of uh, low code assets and code first assets fused together through the build process, right? And so for those of you who aren't familiar with what Phil's talking about, it's the idea of, you know, you wanna write your your web resources in TypeScript, right? When you do a .NET build on your CDS prod, you want, uh, when it's a debug, you probably want un, you know, minified, you know, very ugly JavaScript files with comments and everything in it. When you wanna release it, you wanna bundle it, minify it, all this good stuff, uh, you know, modern web practices. So. You can do some of that stuff today. It's not apparently obvious for people. I'm gonna send you a link to uh, a repo that I just updated called Hello Fusion Dev. And one of the things I do in there, if if you look at the CDS project, and I can actually pull this up. You know, let's just pull an audible and I'll pull it up. Um, uh, I'm gonna share my desktop over here. Which one is it? I think it's this one. Yep. Okay, good. Um, and if you go into the CDS Proj here, you will see that I've got, um, I'm using, I'm just using MS Build. So CDS Proj is based on MS Build, right? And um, uh, I'm using build targets to execute MPM. And I've got a whole, I'm not gonna go into a entire walkthrough of this, you know, I, you know, vote it up, put it in the, in the chat. I'm happy to do some video walkthroughs of this. I was, you know, planning on doing it already. It's just a matter of time. Um, but you can do a lot of this stuff today. I think what we hear from people is that they want it to be easy button, right? And they want um, us to have gestures within uh, PAC CLI that help you bootstrap all of this stuff and just get it working. So you don't have to be an expert in MS build and you don't have to be an expert in TypeScript and like, and we just sort of scaffold out those things for you. Um, this is an example of something that I would ask. Let's start to get pretty granular on our public repos. Um, you know, like if, if for example, uh, if you go to github.com, Microsoft um, Power Platform Build Tools, right? We'll, we'll use as a, an example. And you go to discussions, like put a discussion in there. Get your friends to upvote. Don't like, you know, we, we focus more on the upvote of the, the, the discussion or the suggestion, but upvote like crazy. We pay attention to that stuff. Right. And so the more we understand the demand, we can look at the balance of all the work we have to do. And some of these longstanding you know, requests that we've gotten from people, um, you know, and, and oftentimes, uh, you know, we say, well, there's, you know, there's a great community blog post on how to do it over here. We can just point people to there. And, you know, we kind of take for granted that everybody's just going to, you know, be successful using that approach. So I would say get a little bit more granular with us on the, the specific things of, of what you're looking for. Um, I'm certainly happy to to show you and others, Phil, some approaches to doing it today. But, you know, you kind of have to have a secret decoder ring. You have to understand things like MS Build, you know, and MS Build isn't necessarily for mere morals, even us, us professional developer types, right? There's a learning curve to it, et cetera. And so some of this stuff you can actually do today, it's just not well understood and well documented. Um, and so the more we can get feedback from folks, put a comment in there, people voted up, put more granular ideas. That'll give us a good sense of where we need to invest first, you know, given the resourcing that we have. All right. All right. Go ahead and take the screen back, Shafka. I will go ahead and do that. Thank you, Mark. And here we go. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. Okay. Next one. Um, it was uh, submitted by Phil as well for new projects. Um, should we be using plugin packages in lieu of .dlls? Um, I know the docs mentioned to start using plugin packages. Uh, it'd be nice to have recommended, strongly recommended. Want to have an idea of how strongly to push the adoption of this? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take this one as well because I have an opinion here. Um, I was a big fan. Of, so for those who aren't familiar with with what Phil's to referring to as plugin packages. Like historically with um, .NET plugins and, and Dataverse, um, you could not reference external assemblies. And there were all sorts of hackish things that people would do like using IL merge to get third party libraries into your plugin DLL um, or you know, grab the source code from an open source project and you know, compile it into your DLL. There's 
all sorts of, of crazy approaches. But the Dataverse team introduced this new thing that's sometimes referred to as dependent assemblies, sometimes referred to as plugin packages. And it's the idea that you, your plugin can now reference things like JSON.NET and other um, uh, NuGet packages, right? And then when you build your plugin, we take care of packaging it up to all the Dataverse specifics and helping you deploy it to Dataverse um, such that you can do more uh, and more convenient, do things more conveniently within uh, Dataverse plugins because now you have the convenience of third-party NuGet libraries, DLLs, et cetera. Um, so this is, I was a big fan when this was introduced. You know, it's been in preview for a while. It's come out of preview now. Don't let people know about IL merge. Yeah, shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> um, yeah, don't use IL merge anymore, right? Um, uh, no, but th this is now out of um, uh, public preview. It is uh, a generally available feature. Um, I think with all you know features, if it works for you, use it. This is sort of the the way that we think people will prefer to um, to package up their plugins moving forward. It's a different way. There's a learning curve to it. And for those of you who've been in the community, I, you know, I'm sure, heck, some of you still try to push unmanaged solutions to production environments, right? And I only call that out because old old habits die hard, right? And you know, we have a, a commitment to being backwards compatible. So you know, we expect people will use the old approach to packaging and deploying plugins for quite some time. But certainly, we would like to see more and more people start adopting reference assemblies or plugin packages. All right. Thank you, Mark. Um, hopefully that's that's good. All right. So next one is by our friend Daryl. Um, I know there is Canvas unpack pack command in the pack CLI. What exactly is currently supported when it comes to pack command? Are any custom changes to power effects or properties allowed? Daryl, you want to come off mute on this one? I mean, I can kind of interpret, but but I think this this one requires some clarification. Let, let me try to answer it like at a high level, and then you can ask me clarifying questions. So generally speaking, pack unpack uh, is experimental still, right? Um, and so officially nothing supported. Um, it's an experimental feature. Um, and uh, however, uh, if you may have missed the, the conversation earlier or asked it before before I brought this up, we're taking all of that out of experimental, out of an external tool that is required in the pack unpack process. We're bringing it into the service um, and we are making um, uh, it just be something that that is part of the MS app. And also long term, you'll be able to unzip a solution and not have to do anything inside the solution because the folders and the YAML files and all the necessary files will just be there. Right. And when we do that, uh, we will. Uh, also, make sure that we document better, um, you know, these kinds of things that are supported. That's part of our to-do list as we, um, uh, you know, bring this to a, a GA capability. So I would stay, say stay tuned for um, some of our announcements at build and then some of the discussions post-build where we have some clarity on the timelines. Um, but a supported, you know, statement is coming in the near future. Um, but for now, it's it's use at your own risk because it's experimental. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. All right. Um, this was one of the previously submitted question, so that's why you see my my name on it. Um, does anyone have? OK, so the question is um, uh, submitted by Ryan. Is there any way to hide connections in Power Automate so users do not see them? This is related to the DLP policies. Then the second one in there is the is there any way to audit or report on user policy violations when users attempt to add a block connector to a flow? There is, so anyone want to take this? Hey, Chef Cat. This is Chris. Hey, I Chris can, is here. Oh, hi, awesome. Thanks, Chris. Hey, yeah, I can take this. Hey. So, uh, <laughs> good to see you. Uh, yes, this has been uh, something that we've wanted to have uh, built for quite a while. The, it's not so much hide the connectors. We've wanted to disable the connectors uh, for quite a while. Um, this is something that we're going to be pushing on in the next uh, six months. Um, I'm hopeful that this is going to get uh, this is going to get done uh, shortly. So that would be disabling connectors um, so that so that makers don't add them manually into a flow. In addition, 
like the co-pilot angle, co-pilot shouldn't shouldn't be recommending flows that use just uh, use blocked connectors. Uh, so that's kind of the answer to question one is it's it's near the top of our list. We want to get to it. And then the answer for two is, yeah, we don't keep track of uh, those um, policy attempted policy violations um, because the DLP policy blocks them. Um, yeah, we I guess we do have some like internal telemetry related to that, but uh, for the most part, the, the policies are blocking those connectors, so it's just treated as kind of a, a, a build error almost. Um, but if yeah, if, if people are have some need to, to track that data for some reason, um, yeah, maybe you could give me some more details about that in the chat. Thanks. Glad to hear that. Just came up on a recent governance engagement where they specifically wanted to know if there was frequent incidences where users were trying to add those connectors. Okay, yeah, and that would I guess that would point to the value of having the connectors disabled or hidden uh, so that they don't try, right? Yes, thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, so the next one was also uh, posted earlier uh, by Diana. Uh, updates to the uh, Parallel platform. I'd like to learn about good use cases for no code plugins so that I can build one. Yeah, Anyone so I'll, I'll take this one. My my team actually, um, my previous team was part of the low code plugins work. Um, we built the the temporary Dataverse Accelerator app that is the the authoring surface for low code plugins and until it gets brought into Maker. Um, I would say a few things here. Right, in general, low code plugins are really what they sound like. They're intended to be a way for people who know Power FX, um, but not C sharp, to write logic behind the Dataverse API, uh, both in an event-driven way and via direct API calls. And so um, if you're more comfortable with PowerFX over C Sharp, um, or you don't want to have to use C Sharp to do something simple, right? look at low-code plugins. They're still a preview feature. Um, they are not GA as of yet. So I would say you know, use low-code plugins in an evaluation phase, um, but then over time, uh, the goal is to make low code plugins, at, you know, the the productive way for writing the same kinds of things you can do with .NET plugins, but without necessarily taking away the power of, of .NET plugins, right? So it, it's always going to be a matter of choice. There are lots of personas in the Power Platform, and we're trying to cater to all of them. Um, and so low code plugins enable uh, non traditional professional developers um, uh, to to do the same kinds of things without having to learn how to write, learn .NET, learn concepts like assemblies and NuGet packages and all this sort of stuff, right? So both will continue to exist. Um, it sounds like you're also, uh, Diana, looking for more sort of use case based scenarios. And so I would say um, I can pass that, we can pass that feedback on to the low code plugins team that, um, you know, folks would like to see more scenario based guidance on when to use low code plugins. Um, I, I suspect there are some hidden questions in there like, when do I use a low code plugin? When do I call a flow that ex executes similar logic from my Canvas app? When do I, you know, because there's there's more choices now in the platform. Um, you know, with that those that power comes responsibility and flexibility, and and a lot of these things are are somewhat opinionated. Um, and so, um, yeah, take a look at low code plugins, start using them in experimental form and their preview form, and then. You know, get ready for when they're generally available, um, and uh, we'll pass the feedback on to the the team that you want more guidance on on how to use them. Sounds good. Um, so before I go on to the next one, we do have Anthony here. He wanted to share all about the pipelines. Um, so if uh, if we want to get that covered really quick, it should be fairly five minutes, and after that we can cover rest of the questions. Um, how does that work? How how does that sound to you, everyone? Good. Yeah, I don't mean yes. to to interrupt the really awesome Q&A session that we have going on, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get through it fast so we can get back to it. It's a let's it's a let's do it read. Yeah, real. We'll, we'll go ahead and get that thing rolling. Should be short. All right. Awesome. And let me know when you can see my screen. 
Cool, we see it. Yep, exactly. All right. So let's go on to the next one here. Okay. Awesome, Shafka. Do you mind if I take control here? Uh, sure. Very cool. I didn't know how easy that was going to be, but I think I think I have it now. Okay, good. Cool. Awesome. So some of you might have already seen this this morning or yesterday or not yesterday, last week um, at MVP Summit. But um, if you did, try to hold your excitement, I know, and don't spoil it for the rest of the crowd. <laughs> um, but I wanted to come here and present Pipelines for All today. Uh, for any of you who have already seen the blog post as well, that was released on Monday. So um, this is kind of me just going through the process, the reasoning behind it, um, a little bit of a product walkthrough, and then I can answer any questions or take any feedback on it as well. So uh, for those of you who aren't already familiar with the pipelines host setup process that we have today, um, I'll run through it very quickly. So uh, let's say in this canonical scenario, we have a maker who wants to deploy from dev to prod or dev to test instead of manually exporting and importing the solutions. Um, in order to get pipelines all set up for them, um, if they're not set up at all, right, they would have to ask an admin for permission, and the admin would then have to go and take the initiative to read documentation, um, install the D365 package, which is Power, Pla yeah, Power Platform Pipelines um, in PPAC, and then once that's installed, they would have to run the model driven app that we have for configuration and copy the environment IDs that they want to associate with pipelines. So in this case, the admin would copy the environment ID that the maker wants to use in their pipeline and then create that pipeline for them. And then once they configure everything they need, and this could be like approvals, um, pre deployment steps, et cetera, for any of you who have used pipelines, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and after that's all set up, they can then share the pipeline with the maker. And this is a really good way of, of creating a centrally governed pipeline. But um, what if the maker just wanted an easier way to deploy from <laughs> dev to test uh, because they would already be able to import anyway? So customers have told us that this process can take hours. Um, obviously, it includes a lot of reading and understanding of how pipelines work and um, how to set them up. So we said, what if this only took seconds? Um, so today I'm gonna show you uh, what it looks like from a maker first run experience. And we have Contoso app solution here. So this maker goes to the pipelines page for the first time. And as you see here, it says we're getting things set up for you so you can start creating pipelines. This may take a while. That's more of insurance on us. It doesn't actually take that long. Um, so here the, the platform is recognizing that there isn't a host already available. So no admin has set anything up yet. There's nothing in the background. So we said, we'll set it up for you. Um, so now it says you're all set to create pipelines and it lights up a brand new experience that includes creating a pipeline in product. Um, and these are lightweight pipelines. So they're meant for, uh, I guess, personal use really at this point at this moment. Um, so for this, I'm going to create Contoso personal pipeline, uh, which will be my own pipeline for Contoso deployments. And as you see here from the environment picker, I have Contoso UAT as a target environment that I already have import access to. So now I can just create the pipeline like that. And then within 58 seconds, I've set up pipelines entirely. I have my own created pipeline and I can deploy. So, um, I'll summarize all of it and I can get into the technical details too, because I know you guys probably want to know that. Um, but to summarize here, ALM can be made easy for all. Uh, makers can get started with personal pipelines without the lengthy setup process that I went over two slides ago. Um, and then of course, if an admin is ready to set up a centralized governed pipeline, they still can using that process. Um, and then of course they can customize it more, have extensibility steps um, like approvals, for example. But this new era of pipelines means that there's no more importing and exporting solutions manually if the target environment's already managed. So if your test or prod environment is already a managed environment, then makers can start using this out of the box, no worries. Um, and yeah, that's that's really it. Uh, next awesome, question. Hey, there, there are a couple questions uh, that I yeah, you I was, probably, if, if you're any, anything like me, I can't keep up with chat while I'm talking or presenting. Right. So, um, <laughs> so one of them uh, is, you know, I think, probably an unfortunate 
uh, circumstance on our part because uh, people have reported that their admins are seeing something called the platform environment and they're wondering why. Um, and so uh, the, that was <laughs> unintentional, right? But to answer yes. people's questions, yes, this uses an environment behind the scenes. Yes, it's an environment that is Microsoft provisions behind the scenes and is only for Microsoft's use because it all runs in Dataverse, so we need an environment. Um, and uh, we will, you know, uh, you, Anthony, you can you can talk in more detail about that. But the the intent is that that nuance and that implementation detail is not something that that we scare customer admins about. It's just something that's behind the scenes, right? Yep. Yeah. And I was going to address that as well after. Thank you, Mark, for for taking it though. Um, yes, the platform environment. Uh, I'll just let the cat out of the bag here, even though it was already let out yesterday. <laughs> um, is yes, like Mark said, an implementation detail that essentially allows us to provision a host for a tenant um, so everybody in the tenant can use it. It'll still have the same Dataverse level um, record permissions, so it's not like it's a security concern or anything like that. Um, it essentially just enables us to enable the first party application like power platform pipelines in basically in product um yeah, and a couple then, other things if you don't mind anthony because yeah, yeah like, go ahead. people are answering in chat but not everybody gets the benefit of chat so um uh it is not the default environment right that's a right. question that came up in the chat it is not the default environment so don't worry about that um yes it does still require uh managed environments Yes, yeah, this feature does still require your production environments or your target environments rather to be um, managed in order to be compliant. Um, sorry, I'm trying to look through any of the questions that I might have missed. Hey, but... Anthony, can we maybe just ha ask people to go back to the AMA tool and push yeah, the questions yeah, in think, there and then we can get back to the be, AMA tool? That'd yep. be a lot easier. That would be great. Right on. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. Of course. All right, we're back here. Let's see. Hopefully, you can see my screen. Okay. So next one, uh, it's by our friend uh, Phil here. We have requirement to run Power Platform pipelines on a scheduled nightly basis. I can only trigger a pipeline officially via pack pipeline deploy, but this needs something to schedule. For example, Azure DevOps uh, might be possible one day. Anthony? Yeah, that's a this? that's a good question. Um, so if you want it scheduled on a nightly basis, I mean, of course, uh, you could <laughs> you could manually do it in the pipelines UI. I don't know if it's possible to create an automation for a pipeline deployment. I, I want to say it is. Mark, you can also keep me honest here because I feel like yeah, I mean, there are a lot you can tools. do it a number of ways now, but pipelines yeah. itself doesn't have a scheduling mechanism, right? So you could you use an Azure DevOps pipeline that's scheduled, right? And you could um, use use the um, the tasks or actions, a GitHub action, right? You can do it from a PowerShell or Azure automation using Pack CLI. You could use a flow, right? And have a scheduled flow that that achieves the same thing, right? And so there's there's a number of ways to do it. Into this this point of like you know many ways to to do the same thing. Feedback that we got earlier. That's kind of the state of things today. Whether or not um, there will be a scheduling feature in, in pipelines itself in the future. That's that's a question for Anthony. Yeah, there's I mean, there's already a like scheduled deployments feature within each individual deployment, but I assume that's not exactly what you're talking about. So, for example, if you wanted to schedule a deployment, like if I wanted to go to pipelines right now and schedule a deployment for tonight at 8 p.m., I could do that because when you go into the deployment configuration process, you can either deploy now or deploy at whatever time you want. But um, if you want like a recurring nightly basis type deployment, uh, we don't have it exactly right now. I'm sure there might be a hacky way of doing it, but I'll keep it in mind though, for sure. I think I think that's something that we could light up in the future. So, uh, I mean, one one man's hacky is a, a, another person's, you know, perfectly fine, right? Like there is extensibility right. in pipelines for Power Platform that would enable you to achieve this scenario, right? But how you use that extensibility and what scheduling mechanism you use and how you connect it all up to work 
is is probably the the more complex and confusing part. But certainly the extensibility yeah. in pipelines for Power Platform exists, right? You can yeah. automate. You can schedule using any kind of scheduling technology. You can automate deployments, you know, um, from that technology, et cetera. And so, you know, perhaps maybe there's an opportunity for us to um, provide some better documentation on how one might do what you're describing, Phil. Um, but uh, yeah, the, all the hooks are there in the platform to do it. Yeah, for yep. sure. Great. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Mark. All right. Next one uh, from uh, our friend Luke. Can you elaborate on getting an environment setting into a solution and how that is applied during deployment? especially as they relate to the concept of managed or un unmanaged. All right, let's um, see. Do we... Yeah, I'm I'm trying to fully understand the, the question here, but um, by getting an environment settings into a solution, uh, I want to know more about exactly, and if anyone has any input on maybe what I might be missing here, please let me know. But yeah, Luke, if you um, want to come off mute, I mean, because this can be interpreted a lot of ways. I mean, are, are right. you, for example, asking, can you put the setting which enables PCF for Canvas apps in your solution? If that were the question, the answer is no, right? That would be something that, you, you know, because it's an environment wide setting and you can't put those kinds of settings and solutions. However, right, the APIs to do that exist and PAC CLI and keep me honest, Shafkat or, or Marcel, I think the Azure DevOps tasks and GitHub Actions also have uh, facilities to use the, the ability to set those settings. But again, you really have to think about when it makes sense to do that, because sometimes when you change a setting in an environment and there's lots of solutions deployed to that environment, right? It is an environment setting, not a solution setting. And that setting can have side effects to other things in the environment, which is why it's not part of this. I, I would imagine it's part of the reason it's not part of the solution system because makers could start be put start putting turning things on and off at the environment level that could impact apps flows and everything else in that environment right so again the mm -hmm. the tooling is there to enable the automation to turn some of these things on um but you really need to to think about using the that those facilities and think about the impacts of them before you actually do it the question was more about those environment level settings it, it, that makes sense to me now that you put it in the context of uh, they may need to be unique. I just know for most of our go live checklists, we've had to add a step for the engineers to go through and compare the dev environment settings to the test environment settings and call out if there's differences. Because after a release, we'll see like, OK, everything's there, but it's not working. And then you have to dig into those details. So trying to make it more imperative like how the environment is set up is configured versus making it more declarative where we have to script out those pieces. And I would say for, for those scenarios, Luke, our guidance moving forward will be something called environment groups, right? Which will yeah. allow you to basically group a set of environments that have consistent settings together, right? Such that um, you can ensure that when you move from dev to test, the experience will be similar. Certainly you can, with the APIs and the platform and some of the tooling, you can achieve these concepts yourself, right? But it is one of those with power comes responsibility kind of thing. So be, be very, very careful uh, and think through the impact because we don't know what your environment strategy is. We don't know if you just have one environment for your, your solution or you have thousands of apps deployed in your environment via solutions, you know, et cetera. Like every customer um, that I've ever met has some similarities in their environment strategies, but also a lot of differences in their environment strategies. So there isn't a one size fits all answer to this other than environment groups moving forward. All right, great. Thank you, uh, Mark, Anthony. Um, we're at time right now. Um, let's see, we would be happy to. OK, let's go through one more question here and then um, uh, we can follow up on the rest of them. OK, uh, oh, sorry. So uh, where did that question go? Mm -hmm. Just a second here. It's, that is. My apologies, Eric. Uh, there you go. We are back. Uh, so the question here is, um, do production sandbox and development environments have different resource allocation? 
for example, should we expect performance differences depending on the type of environment? The answer to that is yes. All right. All right, well, it sounds good. Uh, I think uh, that will uh, call it good for our AMA today. Um, and the final thing, I just wanna make sure that uh, we are, let's see, I'm going to present this uh, really quick and, and uh, there we go. Okay, so let's see. So please do join our uh, Discord servers. Keep providing us feedback. We have the um, list for, uh, we have a link for our office hours, our community. Uh, these are all those different places where you can provide feedback. Also, you can go to the uh, community. You can, we have uh, GitHub um, uh, repos where you can go ahead and um, provide ideas, discussions, and issues, bug report bugs if it's critical. Please do uh, uh, file the support ticket. We will go ahead and, and get this uh, video published in next uh, um, 24 to 48 hours. Um, our previous videos uh, you can view at this link on the screen. So we want to thank you for attending our um, office hours and we will look forward to seeing you next month you guys all have a great rest of your day wherever you are at thank you for some reason i made the old timer list this one actually shaka can you leave it on the discord the uh, links community links slide please i uh, sure let's see here there you go All right, I will go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you, everyone.